today I'm going to tell you a story, a familiar story that many of you have already heard. Many of you, if you've been in church for a long time, you're like, man, I've heard that story. But I want to take it from a little bit different angle. I want to take it from some questions that if you found yourself in this story, that maybe, just maybe, you should ask yourself. Because when we think about this story today, it is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is when Jesus came into town on a donkey. He came into town to Jerusalem. And you may have heard that story before. But it's really about the entrance. Because it's an entrance like no other entrance. And when I was starting to think about entrances, I mean, one day, my daughter, she will be married. She will walk down the aisle, and I will give her away. As I give her away, I will threaten her future husband with his life and her four brothers as well. So I'll, like, give her away, and then I'll do the wedding because I'm her pastor as well. So I'll probably do both. Hopefully I get paid for that as well, but we'll see. We'll see. But one day, there will be an entrance, and weddings, they have amazing entrances, And then I started thinking about what is the entrance that I saw that just is like, whoa, that was an entrance like never before. Well, you got to go back for me to 1995 for all the millennials are like, when the late 1900s, my kids, whenever I tell them stories, they're like, dad, you were born, you were around in the late 1900s. I'm like, you know, but in 1995, we heard this phrase, I'm back. And it was when Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player of all time, came out of retirement for the first time. And then he did it again, and then he retired again, and you kind of know the story. But I remember this game and the entrance that he made and and the, the, the fanfare and just how publicized this was. This was like a major event. I'm like, it's like Jesus returning Michael Jordan returning in our world. And for me as a kid, I wasn't following God really at that time. So for me, this was like unbelievable. And even the next year, my my parents got us some tickets to the game to, believe it or not, they came to Peoria, Illinois, to the Civic Center. And when we went to the game, we had had seats like four rows behind the basketball hoop, amazing seats. And we were there, and as they would shoot shots, you would see the the light bulbs off all the cameras. That's right, there was no phones with cameras, very few. Only the, the high elite people had those phones back then. But all of these flashes went off with a single shot of the game. And the amazing thing was that at this game, we went to this game, man, it was so crazy as the players were leaving in the buses, crazy families were chasing the Chicago Bulls bus. Is that crazy or what? Turn to your neighbor and say, that's crazy. And I, as a child, made my mom chase the bus as well with my other brothers. And we chased them to the airport, you know, trying to get some autographs, scrubs, they didn't sign anything. But as I thought about the entrance, I thought this was, this for me, there's just so many people. And so many people were at the entrance when Jesus came. It was Passover time. Passover is when God rescued the Israelites using a leader. God always re- uses a man or a woman with a plan to reach man. He used him to free them from slavery. And so we have Passover. The, Israel, the Israelites, they're coming to Jerusalem. They come to make a sacrifice for their sins, for their families. And so it's a big party. It's a big celebration. It's like the pumpkin fest on steroids. I'm telling you, from a quarter of a million to some scholars say two million people in this small city that was probably usually like 30 or 40,000 people, maybe even less. But so we've got this massive thing happening. And as I found myself thinking about the story, I was like, whoa, these questions, whoa, they're for me. They're for you. And we've picked it up in Luke chapter 19, verse 30. This is found in all four Gospels. So if it's found in all four Gospels, it's the point of view of Luke. Luke was the doctor. Luke was a follower of Jesus. He was not one of the first disciples. He was a disciple later. And we pick up the story. We step into those sandals and and look on the streets of Jerusalem. Here we go. Luke chapter 19, verse 30. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He's coming up to Jerusalem, a 17-mile trek, 4,000 feet. They go to a city, Bethany and Bethpage, and they stop right there. And Jesus says this to two disciples. He says, go into that village over there. As you enter it, you will see a young, a donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. Come on, let's say that together. One, two, three, the Lord needs it. So they went out and found the colt, just as Jesus has said. And so we think about this. Jesus sees the future. He sees your future. He sees my future. He's got a great future for you. Promises to give you hope and a great future, not to harm you. 
That's what Jeremiah says. Is anybody thankful that God has a good future for you? God has a good future for you. Somebody's got to be alive. God has a good future for you. So Jesus sends, I don't know, it doesn't say their names, maybe Thaddeus, maybe Bartholomew, to go get this donkey. Now think about that. He's sending them there. He also says, hey, when you go to get it, the guy's going to ask you, hey, what are you doing taking my donkey? And you just say, the Lord needs it. I mean, kind of like some Jedi mind trick or something. I mean, can you imagine that? If you just went to down, down on the river, one of those boats, and you're like, hey, what are you doing with my boat? I ah, just, the Lord needs it. I'm the Lord's servant. I need a tan. I'm going to borrow your boat for the day. With gas prices. Hey, what are you doing around my electric car? What are you doing around my Tesla? <laughs> the Lord needs it. I mean, kind of a crazy saying, the Lord needs it. But Jesus knew the future. Let me ask you that question for you. Is there anything the Lord needs from you? As a follower of Jesus, again, if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're here and you're, or you're watching online, you're like, ah, I'm just kind of checking out God. I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm re-looking at my faith. I'm evaluating. Is this, is this something I want to continue with? Hey, I want to tell you, Jesus, if you're going to follow him, he is going to ask things from you. And it will not always be easy. The world, we have taken, taken, taking, kind of just made up a word there. We have taken the American dream and infused it. The American dream is, it's all about you. I love America. Aren't you thankful for America? I'm thankful for our country. I'm thankful my dad served and sacrificed and was willing to sacrifice. He's alive. He was willing and so many men and women who do that. But for our freedoms, but we've confused, it's all about me and my dream. And it's not wrong to have dreams. It's not wrong to have things. It's, but if it's always just about you, that is really the opposite of the gospel. I hate to tell you that. Maybe you're like, man, I've been going to church for years. I thought it was all about me. God loves me. It's all about me. No, it's about his glory. It's about his honor. It's about his favor. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's coming back one day. And those of us that love him, we're, we're going to spend eternity with him. And again, not that God doesn't have great stuff for you. He really does. He really has good things for you. And for someone, I want to free them today and just remind you, God has good things for you. If you're always negative, it says in Proverbs that as a man thinks in his mind, so is he. If you're always thinking of the worst case scenario, the negative, well, then that's what you're going to, that's what you're going to be. God has good things in store for you. I'm a father. I love to bless my children. I love to see great things over my kids' lives. So we've got to focus on the positive, not the negative. But is there anything that the Lord needs from you? Think about your time. Think about your talent. Think about your treasure. All of those things. I would look at my life and go, man, I don't feel like I have a lot of talent. I've seen some other people and be like, wow, they're really talented at that. Wow, they're really good at that. I think all of us go, okay, God, what's, what's my purpose? What's my talent? But God will say, hey, will you use your talent for me? Maybe the most important thing, the, the biggest thing for me, my time. Hey, can... Can God use some of your time to build the next generation of kids in our e-kids rooms? Can God use your time to serve students, to be on an outreach team, to make a meal on an e-care team in the church? Can God use your time to open up your house to say, yeah, hey, we'll, we'll have a Bible study and we'll pray over one another and we'll be the community of God, we'll be the church of God. I'll open my home. Can, you, can God have your time or... Have you just kept that old line? Ain't nobody got time for that. I mean, it's old. It's outdated. But I see a lot of people living it out still to this day. What about your treasure? Oh, Brian, you, I thought you talked about money last week. I get funny when people talk about money. But can God really, does, is he first? Can he trust you with it? This weekend is our Easter offering. We'll, we'll take up an Easter offering. It goes to our second location. We want to populate heaven. Anybody else want to populate heaven? You want to like be a part of making a difference? So we'll do that. We'll sing a song, but we'll bring an offering above and beyond our regular giving. If you've never given regularly and you're like, man, this is my church. I want to be a part of helping people make it to heaven. That's, that's, what, that's what the church is about. Maybe. Ephesians 2.10 says it, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. God does have a good work for you. If you came and you've just, over the years of your life, you've just coasted, 
I'm telling you, some of the greatest relationships and friendships you make in the church, some of the greatest opportunities to use your gifts and talents can be in the church. See, the world has, has, has sold this bill of goods, and so often we forget that, man, you're, you're called, you're chosen. God wants you to be a part of a church and use your gifts and use your talents. So the story continues. The story continues. John chapter 12, verse 13. Jesus is going up the mountain. And the Bible doesn't say this 100%, but it kind of gives us this picture. So Jesus is going up this elevation, and there would have been a moment where Jesus would have been able to see and look out and see the Temple Mount. Now, you can see it today, this gold dome, the, 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 this golden dome. And in those days, it was Herod's temple. It was the church of his day. I mean, you talk about, if you, if you have a problem with finances, Solomon was like a multi-billionaire, and he built one of the most unbelievable churches ever to the glory of God. But Jesus may have seen that and the sun hitting the roof, hitting the gold all around the building. And it was kind of like a moment, like it was a kind of an entrance, like all the people taking the photos at the game. Like you've got thousands of people, like Jesus has an entourage, like everyone wants to be around Jesus. A lot of the people there, they had seen Lazarus healed, Jesus raised him from the dead. They had seen and heard about two blind men coming back to see. And so you've got this crowd, this with Jesus. And it says in John chapter 12, verse 13, it says, so what did they do? They took palm branches off the trees and they started throwing them on the ground. They started waving them. Jesus is riding on this donkey. Hmm. Verse 36, as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. All of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. We heard that, Christmas. A child would be born, the angel showed up, glory to God in the highest. Verse 39, but some of the Pharisees, the Pharisees are the religious people who always seize and try to take the moment from God. I mean, we have Pharisees today. We have Sadducees today. Instead of bringing God the glory, they make it about themselves. I mean, I've done that before. Have you ever made it about you instead of about God? The Pharisees will always do that. They'll always go, oh, well, the Bible says this, and the Bible says this, and, and, and we have the word of God. We, we believe in the word of God, but we also believe in the spirit of the word of God that is peace, joy, love. Doesn't it say hope, faith, and love? And this remains love? And so we have some people who are telling everyone that they're wrong, but forgetting to live out. The truth, it's truth and grace. Aren't you thankful that God has been gracious to you, that he has been kind to you, loving to you? So you got these Pharisees, they say, hey, teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, if they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. So you got these Pharisees are like, wow, oh, man, can you believe it? This is blasphemy. You got Jesus, this miracle man, this teacher who's taught like never before. He's coming on this donkey. It was fulfilling a prophecy in Zechariah 9, 9, 500 years before that the Messiah would come. So you have him coming down the descent into Jerusalem and you got the Pharisees seizing the moment, sneering and jeering and going, whoa, this isn't right. This isn't of God. And they were just trying to jam Jesus and all of his followers. Yet the followers, I have to tell you this. At first, you kind of read it, you're like, wow, that's cool. We should be giving God his props. We should be celebrating. We should be singing. That's what the Bible tells us to do. And our church, we want it to be a singing church because God loves a singing church. Even if you sing off key, it's okay. We'll make it loud enough so you, you can sing off key. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say he was talking to you. But that's okay. But God loves your worship. He wants to hear your worship. He really does. I was not raised in the church. And I have to tell you, one of my fun, the funniest moments ever in the church is I showed up to this youth group and these people had drank the Kool-Aid. I'm talking like they were like dancing and stuff and moving and I'm like hands raised and I'm like, what in the world is going on? One of my first church experiences. And then I looked through the scriptures and I'm like, whoa, God likes it. God has a love language. He likes it when you sing, even if it's off key. He likes it when you bow. He likes it when you humble yourself. He likes it when you kneel. He likes it when you lift one hand. He likes it when you lift two hands. Carry the TV, whatever it is, whatever your, your version of the worship moment is. Hand over the heart. That's kind of mine. Like hand over the heart. God, make sure my heart's right. Whatever it is. But God loves your worship. And these people were 
not really worshiping though. Because I read the text and I'm like, oh man, that's cool. These people are like going for Jesus now. Jesus is the man with the plan. He's coming to save and rescue. They were shouting Hosanna, which means save now. Man, do we need our world saved more than ever now? And guess who he's going to use to do it? You and me, the church. We're going to point people to Jesus. We can't save the world. Only Jesus can, but he uses the church to shine bright in a dark world. You look at our culture, you look at all the craziness that are happening, that is happening. We got men becoming women, women becoming men, people saying what's wrong is right, what's right is wrong. The world, you're like, whoa, this is crazy. God said all this stuff would happen. All this stuff the last two years, I mean, God said this stuff in the Bible. So people are like, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? We're fearful, we're gonna die. Guess what? You are gonna die. And I'm going to die. I don't know about you, but I know about me. I'm going to live forever. Because even though he dies, he lives. I mean, some people are like, I don't know if he's saved. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I'm not, not by my good works. Oh, my good works are filthy rags compared to God's righteousness. I'm saved because of Christ and his work for me. I put my faith in him and to the best of my ability, I choose to follow him. I, I get it wrong a lot of times. But he did this thing for me where he died, he was buried, he conquered my sin, he took all of my shame. You ever done something that you go, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Some of you are like, today. Yes, I did that today. But our righteousness is found in Christ and his work upon the cross, and you've got all these people. They weren't really true worshipers. They were wanting Jesus to be what they wanted him to be. And I'm not here to jam your personal relationship with God. I'm not here to question your faith. But expectations will mess you up. Husbands and wives, you know what I'm talking about. Got really quiet. We expect things. We don't get what we expected. We get something else. Our kids, sometimes they don't get what they expected. They expect something else. The people in Jesus' day, they expected Jesus to save now from the Roman government from the Roman Empire that was corrupt, sounds familiar. About pleasure, sounds familiar. Trying to run the show, sounds familiar. Denying God, sounds familiar. Many gods of worship, sounds familiar. The thing we learn about history is history never changes because we're humans and we ain't that bright. Jesus actually says you're kind of like sheep. You can go on TikTok, you can go on Instagram. Have you ever watched, there's this one sheep, he's like, Someone bends down, he picks him up and rescues him. He's all alone, and then like two steps later, he gets stuck right back in the ground. We're like that. We start following God, and then we're like, oh, we're gonna go back the way we came from, even though God has already healed us, forgiven us, and gave us a brand new start. But these people in the Bible, man, I would call them the Pop Rocks crowd. Do you remember Pop Rocks back in the day? Right here, man. Pop Rocks. These, these things will make some noise. Now, I put these in my mouth earlier, and for about a minute and a half, as I was preaching, you just heard, God loves you. God's got a plan. What? And then I lost my voice. Apparently, you can be like intolerant to pop rocks. So my daughter <laughs> sent me this from watching online. And I was like, my voice changed. I was like talking somewhat normal. And then all of a sudden it was like, hey, good. we're going to pray for the clothes. It was embarrassing, but I'll do anything. I'll be a fool for Jesus, right? Come on, I'll be, you'll be a fool for Jesus. The Pop Rocks crowd, they, they were like, oh, we want you, Jesus. We love you. We're worshiping you. But they were only really worshiping Jesus to be what they wanted him to be. They wanted him to deliver them from Rome. And Jesus didn't come to deliver that way. See, in ancient times, the king would come on a war horse, sometimes in peace. David rode a, David rode a donkey, a colt. Solomon, I believe, did as well. But he didn't come that way. He came in humility. I didn't come you, to deliver you from this physical world. I came to deliver you from the spiritual world. I came to die and conquer death and defeat sin. <laughs> And at the end of the week, you'll see it. But these people, man, they were like, Jesus is our hero. Hosanna. To at the end of the week, crucify him. Same crowd, 
same people. And I thought, wow, do, am I louder than a rock? Am I a rock sometimes? Do rocks cry out louder than I do with my worship and giving God his props and his glory? Is there anything else that I'm worshiping more than I'm worshiping God? I love sports. I love, I've been to so many basketball games this year. They should give me a participation trophy with all of my kids. I mean, I really should. Encourage myself. Good dad. But I don't worship this stuff. I have to tell my kids, don't worship this stuff. This stuff will never satisfy. Possessions, a platform, pleasure, it never will satisfy. And you can look at our Hollywood culture. I mean, that's who we get our moral values from these days. Apparently, they have something to say. I mean, am I the only crazy person? Do you just watch this stuff and you're like, wait a second. No, that's not right. I, don't, I, I gotta go check the Bible. I don't think that that's right. No, we, we have to ask ourselves some difficult questions. Do you know that they, the guy who invented the pet rock made millions of dollars? He actually was at a bar one night and had too much to drink, the, the story is. And they were talking about how they didn't like pets. And so he invented the pet rock. And I thought, some of us, we carry the pet rock with us. And sometimes we act like the pet rock when we keep God's worship to ourselves. Jesus said, hey, if you don't cry out, the rocks will. The Psalms tell us that the, 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 the creation declares the glory of God. The ocean will declare the glory of God. The heavens will declare the glory of God. If you don't, nature will. God is so good, he can't not, he can't not be worshiped. But I've thought, I've asked myself that, man, Brian. Do you hold back your worship sometimes? Well, Brian, are you like in the crowd one moment? You're like, for Jesus, Jesus is your hero until you don't get what you want. Whoa, I've done that before. Jesus, I need you to do this for me. And then he does it a different way. I'm so thankful God didn't do most of the things that I prayed for. Like if that was the case, I'd be married to Karen in fifth grade (laughs) because I thought it was gonna work out. I'm thankful that it didn't. But these Pop Rocks crowd, they were cheering, but really their hearts were far from God. I watch people in the church world do the religious thing, check it off, and and you just know. Like, you you just know. You just know maybe you're distant from God. You just know, hey, when you started following him, it was about Jesus. Like, you gave your life to him. You would serve him. You would sacrifice for him. You would give him your time. You would spend time with him. Even though you didn't understand things and you had questions and God can handle your doubts and God can handle all the things you ask of him. And it was real and it was sincere and it was true. But over time, I've had this happen many a times where God's like, hey, I want to spend time with you. Like, I know you have the verses memorized. I know you know what to do but actually I'd love to spend time with you. Time, time with God. Spending time with the author of time will actually give you more time than you realize because then you'll realize what's important and what you're wasting your life on. And I've spent my time, a lot of times, wasting it when I didn't spend time with the author of time to show me where I should spend the most important time. I can't repeat that. You have to get it on the YouTube. But it's true. <laughs> but we see a lot of these people, they were coming. And I thought, man, what if rocks could talk? Like, think about the rocks in the Bible. When Moses hit the rock, the Israelites were complaining, and water came out. That rock might say, God's really your provider. You're in the desert. You, you need manna. You need water. That rock would say, hey, God provides. What about Nehemiah when he built a wall around the city for protection? Those rocks might cry out and say, he's your protector. Why are you afraid? Why why are you scared? What about the woman who was caught in adultery when her sin and her shame and all of the Pharisees tried to take the moment and then in that day they would pick up rocks, someone caught in adultery, someone caught in shame. They would stone her, they would throw rocks and kill her or him. And Jesus said, hey, you without sin, you throw the first stone. If you, if you have no sin, you throw it. That's so why we got to be very careful about judging people. Yeah, we, 
as Christ followers in the church, we do. Some people are like, oh, the church is judging me. No, we, we don't judge people. Only God can judge them. Only God should judge. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful that he's such a good judge. He doesn't give me what I deserve because he has a lot of grace for me. So the church, we don't need to judge people, but we do need to hold people accountable. But these Pharisees, they were taking it to another level. <clears throat> they were taking it to another level. They were taking it to the level where Jesus said, hey, if you have no sin, cast the first stone. And one by one, they dropped the rocks. What would those rocks say? You're forgiven. Your shame is gone. I mean, I think all of us could be in that situation. Maybe not for adultery. Maybe for greed. Maybe for lust. Maybe for lying. All of those Ten Commandments. All of us have broke them. Right? You, you broke the Ten Commandments too, right? I should probably raise both hands. I've probably broken them more than once. But in the grace and mercy of God, the law shows us what we can't do. It shows us how we can't live the perfect life. And Jesus comes. He makes this amazing entrance into the city. Divine Savior coming humbly. Are you louder than the rocks? What does it say in verse 40, 41? It says, but as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. Verse 42 is just crazy. This is what Jesus says. He says, how I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Turn to your neighbor real quick and just say, don't be late. Don't be late. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. So we have this crowd that Jesus gets going into Jerusalem. And then I've never really paid attention to that part of the passage. I just knew that Jesus is the Savior. He came into town. He fulfilled the prophecy. He was the Messiah. He was the deliverer. People were cheering. A lot of people were cheering, were fake fake followers, not real followers. They were only there for what Jesus could do. The disciples were followers. And you have all this scene, this chaos going on, this celebration going on, the Pharisees getting mad at Jesus. And then Jesus, that word weep means that he begins to sob. Like, like an intense emotion. The savior of the world sees all of these people and he says they missed it. They missed it. I wonder year after year, Easter after Easter, opportunity after opportunity. See, God's so good in his grace that he works all things for the good of those that love him. And I'm thankful for that because I'm sure I've missed it many a times. But there are some things not to miss. The Jewish people missed the real Savior on that Palm Sunday. And Jesus wept. Now the theory is this, that when he came down the hill, he went into the golden gate. There was the, the walls and there was all these gates around the city. This is a picture of it today, this, this golden gate. This mercy gate is where Jesus went. Now the reality is, some scholars believe that, that that's just, he came down and then he went into the temple and Jesus would teach. But other people believe that maybe, just maybe, because it was Passover, because that's when they sacrificed things. See, your family and my family, because of our sin, we would have went to church, the temple of the day. My family, the tribe of seven, we would have bought lambs. We would have taken those lambs or those doves, depending our financial situation, what we could afford if we were poor or not poor, and we would take those, we would give them to the priests, the priests would sacrifice them, and that would, that would be a part of our atonement. Meaning that the, in the mercy of God, re receiving the grace of God, that our sins would be forgiven. And we would do that at this Passover celebration. And the theory is that Jesus, maybe he went into that gate, but maybe he went into another gate. The sheep gate. The sheep gate today. That is the place where in that time, in that week, they would have taken thousands of little lambs. 
ready to be purchased. Did you notice that? Ready to be purchased for your, the sacrifice for your sins. And I wonder just maybe in that great entrance that Jesus showed the world, just maybe, hey, not only am I coming as a humble servant, a humble king, hey, I'm just reminding you as I go through the sheep gate <laughs> that I am the Lamb of God. John 129, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I don't know about you, church, but I'm thankful that Jesus takes away my sins. The entrance. Palm Sunday, Jesus riding into Jerusalem. Hey, what crowd are you in? Are you in the Pop Rocks crowd? Do you find yourself just kind of, yeah, I'm I'm here. Yay, Jesus. Uh, But you know, deep down in your heart, you're serving God for you because it's really not about you. When you realize it's not about you, the crazy thing, God kind of makes it about you. He's like, you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you. I'm gonna show you how to truly live. When we give our lives away, there's a sign outside. You find life, you find Jesus. You find Jesus, you find life. And when we give our lives away, man, we truly discover what God has for us. The crowd was big, the crowd was real. Hey, where do you find yourself? In the crowd this weekend. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Lord, as we celebrate Palm Sunday, we realize that, whoa, Lord, so often, God, sometimes we've all built our lives on things that really don't matter. We've been in that Pop Rocks crowd. But Lord, you just remind us this weekend with some, some maybe some tough questions we gotta think about. Is there anything the Lord needs from you? Is there any way to use your talent, your treasure, your time to advance his church, his kingdom? Or is it just always about your kingdom? And when it comes to your worship, are you louder than a rock? The rocks will cry out if you don't, because God is so good, God is so holy. Even creation cries out. They know who their king is. They know who the author of time is. They know who the author and creator of creation is. And just maybe a question to ask this weekend is, just as Jesus was moved, what moves you? What moves you to say, God, I have to do something. I gotta help people. I I wanna be a part. I don't wanna waste my one and only life. Who is it that you need to invite to church as Easter is approaching? Who is it that that you just know, hey, they're, man, I'm not sure how they're doing. I'm not sure about their marriage. I'm not sure about their kids. I'm not sure about their family. I'm not sure about where they'll spend their eternity. Father, my prayer for us is that you, as we ask these tough questions, not always easy questions, but Lord, real honest questions. God, what moves us? I pray that you would move your church. You move me, God. Forgive me for times where we check the box. We thank you. And those are all good things. We hear your word. We, we worship you. But, but God, I pray your Holy Spirit this week would move us. Move us to invite people. Move us to reach out to people. Move us to make make it not about our kingdom, but your kingdom. I'm gonna pray a simple prayer today. And if you just be honest, maybe you're online. Maybe you're in here and you're like, Brian, I'm, I'm wandering away. I'm like that little lamb. And Jesus came to take away my sins. I wanna know forgiveness. I wanna know what it means to really follow him. I wanna give you that opportunity. Maybe, Maybe you've done that before. Maybe you just wandered away. Hey, turn back to him today. I'm just gonna pray this prayer. If you need to do that right where you are, you make it your prayer. Make it in your own words. Just say, Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to be God, not only a future deliverer one day when he comes back, but my spiritual deliverer, that he set me free from sin. He conquered death, that one day when I clock out of this world, I can spend eternity with you. That you're actually making a house for me in heaven. And today, God, I want to make my reservation. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Not in my own good works, not in my attempt to be righteous and not doing the wrong things, but doing the right things. But Lord, putting my belief and faith in a Savior who took it for me. He took my pain. He took my shame. And today, Jesus, I want to choose you. 
I admit I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on that cross. You rose again. And today I, I just confess, God, that I need you. I need you to help me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me all the days of my life. As I'm closing this prayer, if you'd just be honest and say, hey, Brian, as you pray that, would you include me in that prayer? Would you just lift up your hand? Say, include me in that prayer. Thank you for your honesty. God sees you. He knows you. And he's got a great plan for your life. Father, thank you for those that are making a decision to follow you today. Lord, it says when one person gives their life to you, that all of heaven celebrates. So Lord, may we do the same as our teammates in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...